and Senator Mark McDonald. Our oldie, our experienced legislator. Oldie but goodie. Well, being the newbie, I'll start out, I guess. Um, and I mean, this is this is pretty open. So, however, people would like to, you know, if you want to throw in questions, go for it. But I'll give you a little synopsis of what we're working on at the moment, what the first month has been like, and then uh, uh, maybe Mark, maybe Jay will add something. Uh, so I, I started uh, just a month ago. Uh, it seems like it's some days. It seems like it was yesterday, and other times it seems like it was a year ago. But it's been. Uh, Quite a ride so far. Uh, I'm on the healthcare committee, which is a, a very, it's a, it's a great committee. has a good good group of people, very diverse, uh, probably very representative of the the state house in general. Uh, and we've been working on some issues there that I can talk about. But there's there's a there's probably five things that are I would say are the big the big items that I I see. Uh, the two that we've dealt with already in some form are the minimum wage bill and paid family leave bill. Uh, both of them were watered down a bit or scaled back from what the original proposals were. Uh, and not being an experienced legislator, I assume that that's what happens. You throw an idea out there and then it gets beat to death and something emerges at the other end. Uh, but the, they, they've both passed the, the House and the Senate. Uh, the paid family leave bill was uh, vetoed by the governor last week. And tomorrow in the House, we'll be having a vote to, to override the veto. And it looks like it's going to be, you know, 100 to 50 or pretty close to that. So it's a, it's a very, very close call on the, on the override. And as the, the new guy and an independent, I, I've been experiencing my, my first taste of, of people twisting my arm and uh, got, uh, got called down to the, the governor's office to meet with one of his staffers who who ended the discussion by saying, well, my boss is going to be really disappointed. <laughs> like, what can I say, you know? I got appointed, and you got to go with what you got. But I, I do support that bill. I, I was a little bit on the fence uh, in the original bill, which was a fairly large uh, payroll tax that was going to be associated with that. The current bill is uh, has removed the leave for any personal illness you may have, but does cover family members or, or caring for a child for a period of time uh, with, with some percentage of your pay. So I, I favored that part of it. And probably one of the, the main reasons I, I was supporting it, uh, even though maybe Governor Scott thought I was a little more of a Republican, uh, was that the his driving message consistently has been we need to attract more young people to the state. And we need to keep the young people that we have. And this, to me, is a bill that, that hits those people directly and should be something that would, would be a plus as you're looking to potentially move to Vermont. Uh, so that was one of my main reasons for, for supporting it. Uh, the, the minimum wage bill is, uh, again, one, as an economist, I was kind of hoping that the market would take care of these things, but it, it doesn't always work that way. Uh, we have a very tight labor market in Vermont. Uh, partly because we don't have a lot of young people stepping into these jobs. And you would hope that the wages would rise to, to sort of entice people to move here or to move into a, a new job or uh, come from another state to commute. And that wasn't really happening fast enough. Uh, and I think the, the minimum wage bills sort of their own little economic uh, arena that, that seems to be something that affects the more rural areas more than, you know, clearly Burlington people are probably not making minimum wage in many cases. Uh, so the, the bill as it, as it was approved uh, scales up the minimum wage a little bit, a little bit faster than it might normally move up if, uh, if you relied just on, on the, the inflation index that they've created. Uh, but it, it gets us to a 12.55 minimum wage uh, in about a three-year period, it doesn't even kick in for another year, and then there's two steps. So it's, I think it's a it's a first first pass. It's not the $15 minimum wage that everybody was looking for, but it, I I believe it's a step in the right direction, and I am supporting that as well. I expect we'll be hearing about a veto and a, another override vote coming soon on that. Uh, but the the excitement will be tomorrow on the on the paid family leave. Uh, 
So those are the ones that are kind of have been percolating currently. Then we've got uh, three others that that are coming down the pipe have been worked on a lot. One of them is the cannabis tax and regulate, uh, which has gotten a lot of attention. <laughs> but uh, a lot of the the information that I've been receiving from constituents has been more against the whole legalization to start with. And I think you have to realize we've already done that, and now we have to figure out how to regulate the market. So I do favor at least the, the last version. I haven't looked, they've done some amendments, and I haven't looked at the, uh, the most recent version of that, but, but that's one where you know, we, we are trying to impose some, some regulation, create some tax revenue that can then support the rest of the government and also support some drug education efforts uh, so it seems like a, a pretty reasonable bill and looks like it has a fair amount of support from what I can tell and what a few of my, my new uh, lobbyist friends are telling me. That, I mean, it's amazing how fast people are your best friend and you want to <laughs> figure out the, where you stand on things. Uh, the, the other two, one is uh, a revamp of Act 250, which if you've ever had to deal with Act 250, it's something that uh, everybody seems to hate. Uh, it, I think, is a well-intentioned bill. It's, uh, I think, coming up on like 50 years old, and and does need a bit of a revamp. And I haven't I haven't delved into that too much. I'm going to a, a meeting tomorrow to learn more about it. I, I think it's trying to improve the the governance governance of the process, and also carve out some exemptions for for areas that are already regulated, like like downtown and other other sort of designated town areas. Uh, to not have them subject to the, the long and tedious process of Act 250. I mean, you still need to protect development and make sure it's done in a sensible way. Uh, it's it's going to be complicated no, no matter what we end up with. Uh, and for those that have tried to go through it, it, it's, it can be painful, I'm sure. Uh, the final one I'll mention is the uh, Global Warming Solutions Act, which is a, a first step. Uh, there's uh, I guess the way it's explained to me is that uh, the, the legislature has set a lot of goals to reduce our, our emissions, to improve our environment, to stop global warming, which I, I do believe is something that's happening. Uh, you know, we could debate that as a separate issue. But uh, in terms of what you do about it, the state has set a bunch of lofty goals. None of them have been met. There's, we're actually moving in the wrong direction. And so I think this, this is an effort to create a framework that has a little more teeth in it, that allows uh, citizens to hold the government accountable for, for doing the things that they, they say they need to do, uh, the, the transportation system and, and other parts of the economy have to respond in some way. So that, that's just kind of kicked off. I, I don't know where it's going, how long it will uh, be debated. It may not even be something that gets finalized this year. Uh, but it is a, a good discussion, and, and it's been an interesting way to, to learn more about the issues. I, I do have a daughter that's a, a, uh, an, uh, an environmental activist, we'll say, and uh, she, uh, she keeps me honest on these issues, and, and uh, so that's a good thing. So I will uh, stop there for, for now, and uh, maybe these guys want to say something, and I can talk about health care in a few minutes if you'd like. Well, we're talking, and it had to do with what Peter was talking about in, the, in global warming and the, the role that um, we've done a great job in this state of redu reducing our electric rates and making the, the electric rate, the electricity much more, um, using less carbon, and we're falling down on the job when it comes to transportation. And the, the little graph that's going around there shows the number of Vermonters, uh, the per percentage of vehicles on the road that are fossil fuel, it's 92%. And um, earlier I mentioned the license plates about the EVs. I bought an EV in September. Um, didn't get the Vermont subsidy, but um, there, there were other subsidies. And um, there's been a lot of emphasis on EVs and switching over to electric vehicles for all the benefits of getting off carbon. But 92% of the vehicles on the road burn gasoline. 7% are trucks and buses. And, and 92% are you know, light cars and trucks. And we really have done zero on finding a way to help Vermonters use less gasoline on the road. Um, I want to go back just a little bit on, on, the, on 
the politics of this, and I'm going to use the word Democrat and Republican, not in any way, in shape, or form about what's sort of going on today. But the Republicans for years were the ones that were more interested in clean water, they were more interested in clean air, and they made some great advances. And they wanted to get off fossil fuels, and they recommended a carbon tax um, about decades ago. And, um, you know, it made sense. I mean, charge more for gasoline, people will drive less. And as things changed in our national elections, the fossil fuel companies began donating more money to both Republicans and Democrats if they wouldn't pass any uh, horrible um, fossil fuel taxes. So um, the original carbon tax it was tough on poor people, it was tough on rural people. And um, so the same people that had entered the, the new group of folks that wanted to keep using carbon and keep selling it, I call them the Koch brothers gang, um, they attacked their own tax for being uh, tough on poor people and, and tough on, on the countryside. So I've been work, trying to work with others on a, on a way to give Vermonters an opportunity who have to buy used cars in particular to go to the used car lot and have a choice. Right now, rural people that don't have a lot of money, the thing is rough on them today. They go to buy a car, and the cars that are available are a lot of gas customers. And it's not like they, they have any choice. they got to buy them. So it's sort of like a hidden carbon tax today. And the bill that we're looking at um, divides the automobiles up into the gas guzzlers and the, and the more uh, um, parsimonious, <coughs> uh, more uh, efficient. Uh, efficient. Efficient, yes. <laughs> uh, and it charges a fee for the, those of us who want to drive a, a vehicle that uh, you know, has a lot of performance and goes fast, and we collect the money, and then it, it's used to reduce the purchase price of vehicles that are more efficient and see if that wouldn't uh, give people the you know, freedom to choose and um, be fair, because you didn't have to buy one. And um, if you did buy one, um, you would be beginning to put vehicles in the market that in five years or so uh, would it be available for uh, folks with lower incomes and that work in the, in, live in the, country, in the countryside. And then it would, it would gradually phase in. Um, the, this has been my operating number. For uh, this year in the legislature, this is 1,336 days, and I kind of use this as my gauge when I think about um, uh, global warming and what you can do. Um, does anybody know what this number represents? Day after Pearl Harbor until the Japanese surrendered. Hmm. Less than four years. Um, the bill that you mentioned, the uh, climate globalization, uh, Cool. Which is a great, a great thing, you know, because it's gonna, it's gonna, if you pass it, it puts the puts our feet on fire. But two two legislatures, legislatures, two elections from now, it's gonna be a different bunch of people in the legislature, and they didn't come in there with, they didn't make the promise to, to, to do this, and um, if they're not meeting their goal, they can just pass a law that says, well, the goal was too aggressive, and and um. Notwithstanding the, the law, the lawsuits don't count, and um, start from scratch. So it, it fails to, it has the right spirit, but um, it, it doesn't, it has its loopholes. When it came to cleaning up the lake, it was the federal government that said the lake had to be clean, and we, in Vermont, Montpelier, couldn't pass a law saying disregard the federal government. Well, you know, it, was, it wasn't ourselves. I don't know if that, does that make sense? The federal government sues you. We can't weasel out of it by changing the law and saying, we'll just get it out for a few. Okay. Um, what's interesting about this 336, you imagine Pearl Harbor being back in, um, on December 8th of this year. Imagine it just happened. There was already an executive order on the 15th of January of 1942 to cease manufacturing all sedans and light trucks. Zero. And the uh, manufacturers came in and said that was burdensome. So they put it off until February 2nd. And as of February 2nd, 1942, no automobiles. No light trucks were manufactured in the United States. 
and that went on for until October of 1945. So, if there's something that you feel is uh, a threat to the system, to the world, and our kids seem to think so, um, it can be done, but you have to do something. You have to do something more than just promising to do something. So we'll see what, what happens from this one. Um, that's the one thing I'm working on. There are other open for questions. Jay. Thanks for coming, everybody. Thanks, Orca Media, for being here. Um, thank you to the library for putting this on, and Peter for putting it together. Um, Peter has been baptized by fire so far. <laughs> We've got a, a, a veto override tomorrow, which is something that only um, the Democrats have threatened in my time, but here we are um, the eve of, and there's a lot of lobbying going on, so um, it's actually more stressful than you'd think. Um, I'm Jay Hooper. I represent the five towns of Brookfield, Braintree, Randolph, Granville, and Roxbury. I serve on the Education Committee, which, let me tell you, is an education in itself. Um, we're talking about five major categories, but mostly we've been spending our time discussing literacy. Um, because in Vermont, about 32% of students by, the age, by, the, by fifth grade are not proficient readers. And, um, that means our school system is failing uh, those students. And that's something that we desperately need to fix. So we're talking about a couple bills to um, screen students uh, in, the, in kindergarten and first grade for dyslexia. Um, but the difficulty on that topic is that there is discrepancy as to what the definition of dyslexia is. And so um, I'm not sure if the folks in this room have ever heard of the reading wars, um, but the reading wars are still alive. Uh, I, I'm still kind of trying to figure out what, what the political lines are of the reading wars, but basically there's this debate. My understanding is the debate is between um, whether or not classrooms are taking a balanced literacy approach, which is sort of a, this, the class moves together, you know, versus a structured literacy approach, which is more individualized and based on phonetic um, teaching which is, uh, I think, the way that students with dys dyslexia end up learning how to read. Um, but that is, there's certainly not a consensus on that topic, and uh, the, uh, the testimony has been vast and stark. Uh, so um, universal pre-K is another topic we've been discussing. Uh, universal after-school programs. Is uh, something that the governor asked the legislature to figure out. Uh, universal free lunch. There's another. There's a bill for for making lunch free to all students. Um, and those are three pretty expensive concepts. So where we're going to get the money to make all three of those things happen uh, is unknown. And I think we have to figure out where our priorities are in terms of which one comes first. Um, but I will say. Uh, today we had some bombshell testimony from Representative Laura Sebelia, who, what, she sits next to you? She's from Dover. Dover, yep. Yeah. Um, who grew up in a poor uh, uh, household, and she um, was lucky to have a good public school that got her to where she is today. She succeeded, but she told us that it's a really rough world out there in Vermont, and a lot of kids aren't as lucky as she was. Um, so she got very emotional in her, in her testimony, and it was very compelling. Um, she basically said, now that uh, we have the report back from the two UVM professors, the Rutgers professor and some personnel from the Agency of Education, as to uh, how we modernize the determinants of um, our funding formula, uh, the weights, so W-E-I-G-H-T, uh, that go into the formula. So, so initially there, are, there were four categories, there's still four categories, but they're kind of antiquated. They're not, they're not really necessarily based on, it was kind of an experiment. So the, so the four categories are English language learners are considered more expensive to, to educate. <coughs> Students who come from households uh, in poverty, um, let's see, what are they, two, 
uh, a high school student is more expensive than an elementary school student and a, a preschooler. Um, so these, but the, and that's not an order, but the point is that there are metrics that go into how we equalize our per pupil spending in this state, which is, it takes about 11 minutes to explain uh, <laughs> the basics. Um, so the report, the good news is that the report came back with a whole bunch of data for why those four categories are, are out of date. They're, they're sort of artifacts. Um, updating three of those categories, uh, adding two categories, and keeping uh, two of the categories the same, if that makes sense. So the, I guess what I mean to say is that we have an opportunity here, hopefully starting this year, to improve our education funding formula so that it's firstly more equitable for students across, across districts and uh, easier on taxpayers. Save monies? Save money. Save the same amount of money in it? Um, I don't know yet. <laughs> so, yeah. Thanks. Always got to be honest. So, um, <coughs> um, I don't know if Peter told you, well, he, he gave you the rundown on the Climate Solutions Act. Um, it's more of a, a government accountability bill than anything else. Um, it gives you all the right to sue us if we don't... Uh, um, sue us, I mean the state, sue the state government. Not us um, personally. Yeah, not us personally. Uh, if we're not upholding our uh, commitment to the timelines and the goals that we set forth. I mean, what's the point in passing goals if we're not going to follow them? And um, I think it's a, it's a good bill to, to move on, and uh, I think we have the political will up there to do so. And the, the Timelines, timelines are a little more rigorous than the ones set by Patsy's legislature um, and McDonald, um, which was, I think, 20, by 2050, it will be 90% renewable. I think we've, we've shrunk that timeline to something like 2030. Um, and some people think, is that going to be possible? And I'm saying, well, we better try. And I think uh, the, the chair, so the chair of the Committee of Jurisdiction today said that I think we can do it, and we just have to. We just have to work hard. We really got to work at it. Um, among other things, we've got a marijuana tax and regulate bill coming up tomorrow. Uh, did you mention that? Yeah. yeah. I think um, I think that that one will uh, generate some of the money that we'll need to do those things in education. Um, I think, though, there will be debate as to where the taxes go, and that'll probably be the bulk of the, the uh, conversation tomorrow in, in ter on that topic. So uh, without further ado, any questions? I'll, I'll, I'll add one more thing on the, on the Climate uh, Global Warming Solutions Act. As, as we heard today in the caucus, the, the <clears> people <throat> behind us, it's seeing John reminded me of that, that it's a big part of what they're trying to do is improve the resiliency aspect of the state and making sure that we can, knowing that these things are coming, do a better job of being prepared for them in addition to trying to reduce the causes of them. So that's, that's a, to me, a very positive thing regardless of what you think about global warming. Uh, and, and again, the specifics of it have not been fleshed out a whole lot, but hopefully it will put more focus on, on the resiliency planning and, and some of the things I know some of the groups you're involved with have worked on. Yeah. And that's not the only climate action that is being discussed in Montpelier. There's another bill that the, the um, transportation some of the folks on the right side of the conversation are, are calling a carbon tax, which, which it is not. Um, it does have the potential to increase uh, the, the price of fuel. But, um, it's called TCI, which stands for Transportation Climate Initiative. It's, um, it's, it's a 12 or 13 state uh, coalition that's trying to put together policy to, to basically create a cap and invest program as opposed to cap and trade. So a carbon tax, as many of you are aware, is uh, basically um, an idea to create a marketplace for, for trading carbon credits, um, which I actually have personal uh, I'm kind of critical of because um, I think that that gives corporations the opportunity to purchase their right to pollute, and that's not really 
that's a little counterintuitive. So um, cap and invest <laughs> is basically where I think after a certain amount of, um, well, it, it basically it puts on an, an additional tax to fuel that, that the money, the revenue from which would go towards uh, investing in transporta rural transportation systems that uh, people can use alternative to drive. Is, is that the regional energy discussion that's going on? Basically. And right now there is no bill uh, drafted. There's no policy on paper that we're pushing. Um, but I, my understanding is, uh, and correct me if I'm wrong, Senator, but um, Senator Tim Ash, the president pro tem, is taking the lead on this issue. And um, you maybe have seen headlines or heard rhetoric from the governor's office regarding his position uh, as to whether he would sign it or not. Um, but the point is that if everybody in the region around us goes for it and we choose to opt out, then we're going to end up paying the tax and not getting the benefits. <clears throat> because Vermont imports all of our petroleum from through those states. So the tax would happen anyway. So it's sort of like, well, we got to you know, think about the implications of, of choosing to not be a part of that. So I think, I think New, Hampshire, New Hampshire's Governor Sununu has suggested that they're bailing on it, which is not great for the momentum of the conversation, but um, <laughs> all, indicator, all indications suggest that he has plenty of opportunity to come back in. And uh, I don't know how legitimate that, um, that is, if he is, if he is out or not. So. I have a question related to that. Yep. Um, we have had, and I'm not sure where it stands at the moment, but we have uh, more land than some people south of us do. And corporations out of state, out of country, are creating solar farms in different places. And I was really concerned about the one that was supposed to be placed up on Randolph Center. Mm -hmm. And um, the issue that I have with that is I don't like Vermont to be used that way. Sure. And so if there was a regional plan, that we all work together on, mm -hmm. then if if it was a benefit to everybody that land was being used here for that purpose, then that would be a whole nother story. But I'm very concerned about that, and I, I want the legislature to discuss that and mm -hmm. think about that and clarify that, because mm -hmm. um, as far as I know, a lot of people don't want big solar energy. Air I'm very much into solar. I have solar on my house and I have Tesla batteries in. Mm -hmm. But I um, but I think it needs to be sized properly and it needs to the benefits need to go to the community mm -hmm. as well as to where else. Sure. Um, good question. I think the guy to take that one is uh, sitting to my left. <laughs> my natural yeah. resources committee mm -hmm. and that's a, a real a real problem that he and I, I have solar panels, so right away I'm, uh, I, I have a conflict of interest. In, but the solar panels and the, and, the, and the net metering folks were the ones that were encouraged to put stuff up on the belief that it would work. And um, much to the surprise of most of us, including those who got solar panels or wind towers, um, it has worked. And now that it's worked, the, the, the corporations and the investors are trying to get in and corner the the market, and they do things in big ways, and they they can produce the electricity, uh, the renewable electricity, at lower rates than than you know I can on my uh, on my solar panels. Um, although um, when it comes, there are other benefits that Vermonters get from net metering. For example, any electricity that's made by net metering. Um, Vermonters aren't charged for the, uh, the national grids. It comes off the Vermont share of paying for the of the New England grid, and that's a small benefit, but um, it's a uh, it something. So we're all going to always going to have the problem of when something catches on. Um, Green Mountain Power is, for example, sells batteries now, and they're not regulated. 
So they're, they're going to want to sell batteries to capture um, electricity and then make a profit from that. Um, net metering people, you have a Tesla battery, right? What, 30, I have two. Two, 30, month, 30, uh, 30 bucks a month each. And you no, have, 15 each. 15 each, my apologies. Yeah. Um, so you can store electricity in, in your home, and if the, the electricity goes out, um, you'll supply yourself. And they take green, it you're green mountain power? Yes. Yeah. So what green power, mountain power reserves the, the right, and that's part of the deal, mm -hmm. to go into your home around this time of night, right now, and take that electricity out so that they don't have to um, purchase electricity from out of state during this peak part of the day. Um, Today was a, a big day for coal being, uh, we, were, we were bringing coal uh, in, in the late afternoon. And some say it was cheaper than, uh, the grid was sending coal in from other states so that we didn't have to use our batteries and we could save them for after dark and where more savings was available. I mean, it's, it's like playing three-dimensional chess. <coughs> with, with, uh, Joan? Mm -hmm. so. Yeah, the, the other problem is that the, land that is being used for this uh, for these arrays is land that produces much uh, that traps a lot more carbon if the arrays aren't there and so I mean there are places where uh, where uh, solar panels are terrific parking lots roofs mm. things like that but not on forest or fields mm -hmm. The, you're correct, and when this thing was really uh, boiling up here about <coughs> the trees to be cut down for, uh, was it the, the former Ranger Project, mm -hmm. and under its a new name now, and on agricultural lands, I, could, I couldn't, there was not the ability to stop that in the legislature, but I put in an amendment on, that said that this was new and hadn't been that in the event that land is taken for solar, for renewable energy projects, that the land that was used for solar energy projects, if it was prime ag land or land in current use, would remain, for the agricultural land, it would remain agricultural throughout the renewable energy project. And if 30 years from now, they they cut the number of uh, panels in half because they're more efficient. That land would remain agricultural. And it was a way to not allow solar panels just by being put there to turn it into industrial use. And then 30 years from now, you find out suddenly, well, it's, it's now eligible for development because it was changed 20 years earlier. So the, the farmers looked at that and one of the fellows from up north, I gave it to him over the weekend, and he said he read it on Friday night, he read it again on Saturday, and he came in on Monday and he says, by Jesus, I read it three times and I couldn't find anything wrong with it. <laughs> <laughs> and we passed it, <laughs> and we passed it. So um, that doesn't solve the problem that you brought up. No, it certainly but doesn't. It, but it does at least keep it from, from being gone forever. And that was no, doable at that time. It's gone yeah. for a crucial time when the heat, when the when the planet is heating up. That's the problem. Yeah. Yes. How, do, how can we avoid John? Avoid corporations to do that? How can we avoid that? How can we? The PUC just 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 uh, okay stuff. Mm. The PUC's obliged to follow the law, and they were given certain authorities. Um, in a couple of cases, we've been able to pull them back a little bit. But um, it's tough. They are appointed by the governor, and they reflect the, the governor's thinking. And um, it's tough. So that's why I need a regional mm -hmm. thinking about it instead of putting, doing, getting too aggressive about it right up front. Sure. John, any questions? Sure, I got a, a few. Um, <laughs> Well, the first thing I'll bring up is going back to the minimum, uh, to the paid leave mm -hmm. uh, positions. I suppose that uh, it, it, 
you know, it, in my heart of hearts, I would love to see everybody be able to, you know, take off if needed and not be too penalized as in the process. Of course, that's never happened in my working career, mm -hmm. however, mm -hmm. but I can see where there is a, you know, a, a real advantage to doing that. Where I come in is this, I'm an old fart, and I'm working at a $14 an hour job to, just because I'm retired age, and you know, there's not much money in my hourly wage. And I don't want to give part of it away to people having babies. I'm sorry. It's just my opinion. I, I want people to have babies. Why should, it, it, why should I have to pay mm -hmm. for the, them to have a baby? When we had babies in the day, we, we planned and scripted and saved. And you know what? They grew up. <laughs> you know, they had clothes. They had food. Mm -hmm. And I'm just wondering about that, mm -hmm. first of all. But I have other questions, too. So don't, let's not end there. OK. okay. <laughs> I, I Is also, that the curveball and you're doing the fastball now? You know, well, you know, it's kind of a slider, but um, <laughs> the educational, all right, I had dyslexia. Yeah. And they, before they invented it, right. you know, they didn't come up with the term until I was in, you know, probably, you know, I was well into my 20s probably when they decided I had dyslexia. <laughs> But I had to learn with everybody else in the same class I was in. Now, I, was, I went to a parochial school, and it was very tough if I didn't learn how to read. So I learned how to read, but it wasn't easy. I have to say, it was not easy. But I can read and write. And I learned how to get over my problem. Mm -hmm. It wasn't defined as a problem. It was just defined as you're stupid or you're slow. Right. OK, I totally do not want that to happen. Sure. But when we talk about a class of, say, 30 people, you know, four people in that class will probably have the same condition I did. And, you know, they didn't give me any special attention. They didn't tell me, you know, you know, they didn't set me as part from the group of people. Mm -hmm. They just made me work harder. And I didn't know I was working harder, mm -hmm. if, if that makes any sense. Are we spending tax dollars to make a dyslexic person, an individual that's mm -hmm. young, a carve out here from the rest of the class? We are not at this time. No, there's, there's not, um, there is not really a, an emphasis on that. At, so that's what we're discussing: is, is whether or not to pass a law to train teachers to, to figure to, to figure out how to detect that earlier, you know, mm -hmm. and that would probably have a cost to it. But what that would look like is unsure. And I, I'm not just dodging your question. I'm just no. saying we we don't know yet. Firstly, whether that's a good idea because this is the, there's tremendous controversy. I mean, today at 3.30, we got, we had two teachers come in and say, you can't do this. This is going to, this is going to be too difficult for us. That like, we can't handle this. We can't. Like, education is changing enough as it is right now. There are, you know, five major changes from Act 46 to, you know, restructuring right. the agency of education. It's not necessarily something that we're going to pursue right away, but the point is that we're trying to figure out. That, and that's a good thing. That, that, that percentage of students who cannot read by the fifth grade is, is, is disturbing. Because <clears throat> there's a reason why our prisons are filled with, with people who are illiterate. There, there are reasons why, uh, you know, people who grow up thinking that they're dumber than their classmates when they're not necessarily go, and go turn to drugs. And, I hear and, that. So, yeah, and, and you know what, first, per, before I go on, I, First, I, rec I commend you, Thank you and Mark and Peter for your service. Thank you. Even if I disagree with you, thanks for sure. putting up with people like me. But <laughs> the other, and up there in Montana, yeah, too. It's worse up there, believe me. <laughs> um, the other thing is, I, I have real concerns about the TCI uh -huh. in terms of the regulatory 
uh, aspects of it that I've read about, and I may be uh, naive about some of it, but there's certain things that that just doesn't smell right. When we have a, when we have a regional operation going on, little old Vermont gets pushed to the side, back burner, and charged more than we should be. And we're stepped on all over the place. And by the way, I live in a rural town, in a rural state, <coughs> on a dirt road. Mm -hmm. How does somebody in Connecticut understand my needs? Right. You know, yeah. and, and understand what I have to put up with to, say, heat my home, Mm -hmm. Go to work, sure, uh, etc. Right. So I, I'm real concerned about like you know somebody in New Jersey telling us <laughs> we have to do something. I'm concerned now about people in Burlington telling us what we have to sure. do. You know. So anyway, this is where I'm sitting. If you could relax me on that. Well, I, I don't want to hog all the questions, but um, we do make sure to put an emphasis on proportionality when it comes to you know people in rural places and people who come from, from lesser means. You know, it, we do make sure that if, they, if we can apply uh, a proportionality metric, then we will. Um, but that, it's a very um, immature conversation at this time. So it, like, I, like I said about the other thing, we don't know yet. And so um, I'll be sure to keep you posted. <laughs> You're getting good at this. <laughs> on the, uh, <laughs> on the you guys I'm learning. <laughs> Sorry for that. <laughs> on the TCI, um, it, it's a form of carbon tax, um, which is, it has the problems that carbon tax has. Um, but the, the problem of passing a carbon tax in one state when the surrounding states don't have one is that people cross the border to get their, buy their carbon. And, um, it's, the TCI, what it, I think it's, uh, was it Benjamin Franklin that said, we better all hang together, because if we don't, we're going to hang one at a time. So it, it's hanging together to do a carbon tax, in which case each state gets a, a similar amount of money, depending on their sales, that any other state gets per person, and the state gets to use it as it sees fit, whereas in Vermont they might give um, preference to people that were less affluent in rural areas, and that's where we would spend our money, whereas in Connecticut, they might spend it on you know, public transportation for the city, so, but um, that's not an endorsement of it, that's just to tell you what the what its benefits are and what its shortcomings are. I know it would be easier to have a national solution to this, so we yeah. weren't mm -hmm. getting these regional divides, but that's not going to happen right away either, so mm -hmm. uh, we're trying, I guess. I mean, we can't even get the results from Iowa. <laughs> <laughs> Do you think you'll actually have some legislation on, on TCI this year, or it sounds like it's still way out there, the way, the way you guys are talking? That, um, well, it's vetoed or not, right? Well, I'll tell you what, uh, the feel from the House side of things is that it, the momentum is, is dwindling right now on that policy. But we are also sort of like, well, we'll see what Tim does, you know. And uh, so I don't know if it's the mm -hmm. same over on the Senate side, but these, some of these seasoned politicians have a miraculous uh, way of maneuvering at the last minute and figuring out and then just creating something. And then, um, you know, it's not to say that we don't vet the, the policy. We, we certainly will, you know. As you know, these bills have to go from one chamber to the other and then back. And then to the governor, and if he beat, you know, so there are a lot of checks and balances when it comes to this kind of thing. But um, I wouldn't give up hope if, if that's what you have. Uh, if, if it passes, it, it's it, it's vetoed. It won't. There won't be an overall. I'm not a big fan of, of carbon taxing mm -hmm. um, because I think it is a kind of a, a shell game in some in some cases, but. You know, I think everything's got to be on the table. Sure. You know, I think I think we've got to look at all solutions, all possible solutions. So, so I'm certainly not opposed to that. Uh, it it just it sounded as though that it was far down the road, and not even this year, the way you were speaking about it. Well, I think I think that the people who are at the table negotiating are are the governor's personnel. Um, so, 
we don't know that much about it. Um, and we can, I, I'll be happy to check in with them on a weekly basis and let you know, John, what is happening. But um, that's how many days I guess it took to find a solution to the military <laughs> conflict. So, um, I think that the governor is, is taking this topic in earnest. And um, I think that he believes in climate change and that we need to act on more than one front. Um, he, his favorite thing is cars, so electric vehicles jazz him up. But um, I think he's open to this. So uh, I'll, I'll keep you posted on that. Okay. I've got another question. Go ahead. Uh, you just mentioned EV cars. Mm -hmm. um, there's not a lot of EV charging available in the state. Really, this seems to be almost nothing on the 89 corridor from a fast charging standpoint. Is the state trying to do anything about that? I mean, if 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 we're serious about EV in the state, then then you know we've got to put in the infrastructure to support it. Mm -hmm. and we're not doing that right now. Right. Yeah. They've thrown right. some money at it, but it's not. Uh, it, from what I can tell, and after what we went through with R3 and trying to get some charging stations uh, through the last round of grants, and they all ended up up in. You know, Whole Foods parking lot in Burlington that yeah. it kind of is demoralizing, but uh, I, I think they are trying to put a little money in there. But I, I, I agree, it's not it, it's not going to be an infrastructure that allows you to be very confident in driving around an electric vehicle, an electric vehicle in, in my view. The Volkswagen was sued for cheating right. on there, and the settlement was millions of dollars. And last year, the uh, transportation department took a big chunk of that money to begin to establish, uh, put in charging stations in an effort to, to start um, EVs. And they have a, they started a subsidy in early December for Vermonters of moderate income to get a check to subsidize the purchase of EVs. There was a piece of digger this morning that kind of saw how a loophole in that was being exploited mm -hmm. by uh, people who already had EVs that were going to trade me quickly to get another another subsidy. And the Transportation Committee by noon has rewritten that <laughs> rule and we'll see how long it takes them to cut that off. Um, the, I, I, I bought an EV. Um, the chair of the transport, uh, there's a member on transportation has an EV, the natural resources in the house has an EV. And they're there are, um, I'm worried about spending a lot of money to subsidize people that have EVs like myself and then turning around next year and, and putting in a carbon tax after all of us don't have to pay one. I mean, that, that would look real good for the Liberal Democrats. <laughs> but, and I'm, I'm a, that's me. Um, so that's, that's a, a worrisome thing. Um, the biggest subsidies and the most come from our uh, electric companies. Um, I'm on Washington Electric, one of the most challenged electric utilities in the state of Vermont. It has only eight customers a mile. <clears throat> um, the next one up, Vermont Electric, has 14 customers a mile. And um, Washington Electric sent me a check for 1200 bucks for having bought an EV. Why are they doing that? Why are they doing that? And, and Vermont Electric sends out checks for 500 bucks for buying an EV. And are they being, uh, are they, is this a gift? Is this a philanthropic thing? Is this a, all the co-op members thinks it's great? And the answer is no, no, no. The reason they want more EVs to be owned by people in the Washington Electric Co-op is because EVs gobble up electricity. And between midnight and four o'clock in the morning, from Washington Electric Co-op doesn't have enough customers to gobble up their electricity. So it gets spilled out in the backyard like you were pouring milk, you couldn't sell. So every time they get a new EV, and the EV in the district, they help them help you get a charger like Green Mountain Power does, they ask you, they say, use this to charge your EV, but only use it between midnight and four o'clock in the morning. So suddenly they're able to sell that electricity to someone which gives them a little more revenues, 
which means they can buy more of the cheap 24 hour a day power for everyone else, which brings the electric rates down. Hard to understand why. Vermont Electric Co-op has a worse problem. They have the same problem not being able to sell electricity from midnight to 4 o'clock in the morning because they're none of you were up enough watching television and doing your laundry at those hours. Um, but they make so much renewable power that they can't get it out of town. There's a traffic jam. So it sits there in town and more milk is spilled. And it goes to waste. And um, we're trying to convince them that they, uh, they should be given larger subsidies because there's a lot of electricity to be used by electric vehicles that would help all the rest of the ratepayers lower their rates. And, uh, they haven't, they're not convinced yet, but they, they're different. They're a different uh, socioeconomic group, and they're, they're kind of not eager to send money to people that own electric vehicles, even if you can do it to fleece the electric vehicle for your own benefit, which is what utilities are doing. Mm -hmm. That's 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 going to grow electric vehicles more than state money Sam. being used for anything other than the chargers. Dylan, you want to go first or stop? Um, well, I was wondering, given that the power that runs the EVs comes from somewhere and that has an inherent carbon footprint, to what extent is public transportation part of the, the climate solutions conversation in Montreal? To, to what extent is public transportation part of the climate solutions discussion in my favor? Um, that's one of the main things that you can implement to, uh, to reduce the carbon footprint for us. Right, right. Did you see that little chart that went around with the graph? Uh, it's over there, yeah. It's okay. <laughs> well, if you look there, you'll see that 7% of the electricity, excuse me, of the vehicles, 7% is trucks and buses. And 52% is, 70, 92% is cars and trucks. Um, they're experimenting with a couple electric buses down in Rutland. And um, I, I'm sorry, guys, I just keep going. Oh, go ahead. The, the question is, if you have an electric bus in Rutland, um, how do you get people to ride it? And why would you want them to ride it? And we were, I think I was arguing with <coughs> Sam the other night that, Maybe if you use the electric bus 10 times and you get your ticket punched, you'll get, you get to go up a certificate for you know, $5 worth of groceries or $3 worth of gasoline. Because every time you use the electric vehicle, you're not driving your car. And the goal of, is to get people not driving their cars to save carbon. How do you get them not to drive their car and get off, you know, Hard thing in Vermont, for sure. You have one, too? Yeah, so my, um, my question for each of you would be, <clears throat> on a scale, and I've got a follow-up question, just so I want the mic back, please. Um, <laughs> on a scale of 1 to 10, what's the severity of climate action now? 10 being the most severe, 1 being lowest priority. You mean, like, as to the political will in the building? <clears throat> No, just a, as a, as an issue for us as humanity. I mean, like, so our personal opinions on that. Sure. Oh, urgency. Um, an 11? Is that on the scale? Yeah, you can take an 11. Okay. We're, this is not pitched against any other issue. This is just... No, no, I'm caught on, on, on the... The Global Solutions Warming Act provides lawsuits and probably isn't going to get any definite legislation that you have to do something for two or three years. Okay, I'll, I'm going to restate the question. <laughs> On a scale of 1 to 10, how severe is climate change? Oh, well, that depends on whether you believe that the oceans are going to get higher and refugees are going to move and we're going to have... More roads washed out. And just more, dancing. Yeah. So I don't know. I, ten? To me, it's my number one priority. Thank you. Okay. okay. So, I give it a 10, but the, the response is, is about a 2 right now. Okay. So, <laughs> so yeah. So, yeah. Yeah. yeah, we're saying the same thing. Right. <laughs> yeah, we're saying the same thing. The reason for my question is, is we, we know that climate change is a serious issue. We know that the science is there. It is a fact. 
We've been denying it for a long time, and now we have to move faster on it than ever before. We have now rolled out new goals to make, to make uh, climate action accelerated, uh, a better number than 2050, 2030. We're saying, Jay's talking about how, you know, maybe they're too lofty, but we gotta try for them. The, the point of my statement is, when, it, when we're talking about incentivizing and decentivizing the use of carbon, when we're talking about a collective carbon tax, when we're talking about solar panels and whether somebody's getting rich off of them or not, we're talking about whether Vermont is being used for, to help the Connecticut uh, millionaires become net zero. At the end of the day, I think the facts are the fact. The facts are the facts. Like it's as severe as can be. So we have no choice but to do everything. And so that that's just my only point in terms of, like, let's not sell this issue too short just because we want to keep a piece of ag land that isn't being at pro. You know, and I I understand the argument with. Um, the Ranger Solar Project, mm -hmm. but I, I'm just playing devil's advocate here to the point that this is this is something serious, and we, yep. we can't be too selfish as to not wanting to change our day-to-day -day sure. lives and the way we do things. When the fact of the matter is, everybody's going to have to change. Well, I think your your impatience is well founded, and we appreciate that. Um, but let me just add to your to your statement. We're also not considering another whole aspect of the conversation and that is preparation for what will come in terms of weather and sort of the fallout as to the impact of what we haven't done. So I think that um, I hear you. I hear you. The concern I have with that, and it's I, I agree completely, is, um, and I, I do, I guess I, I, again, sort of with the TCI thing, it's like we need a, a little more of a national approach to this. And I, I'd hate to see Vermont be the one that, that sacrifices everything to do everything that we can and end up surrounded by people that said, you know, I don't care. and. And so we're we're doing the right thing, but we're we're suffering relative to everyone else in the short term. I mean, the long term, clearly a, a much bigger problem. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, thank you. Uh, Mark, getting back to the chart that you circulated with the ninety-two percent, um, I'm wondering, embedded in that ninety-two percent, what data have you or others collected? Other than other than the financial aspect of it, what are the what are the variables at play in terms of why uh, people are reluctant to to go the EV route? Um, and what strategies are you or others uh, coming up with that can address those other concerns that people have about moving to EVs? People are. It, this I'll just pass this around. This just shows the gas mileage that that um, vehicles get in Vermont. Vermont alone, and the most popular one gets uh, 28 miles to the gallon. That's the middle. That's the middle. So that's the data. That's what vehicles get. Um, and I'm sorry, you're Robert. No, we question the second. No, my question. Is, <laughs> <laughs> um, what, no, my question is. Uh, the implication of that chart, or the, yeah, the implication of the chart is that there's a whole lot of potential out there yeah. for expanding the EV market in Vermont beyond advertising yeah. or license plates. So aside from the cost element, in terms of I'm an individual, I, let's say I drive a petrol car, uh, something is preventing me from moving into the EV world. Okay. Aside from cars, yeah. what are those other things that are preventing me, and what can be done, in your opinion, to address those things? Um, someone asked me what it's like with my EV. It's sort of like where having a set of crutches for the first time, 
and try to ask yourself how far can you get away from the house and still make it home again on your crutches. And it's it's uh, psychological. Pardon? Psychological. Yeah, psychological. Um, so if EVs are going to become popular, they're going to usually be in households that have three or four cars. Um, that's where they should start. Anybody that has three cars in their household that doesn't really consider an EV is probably missing an opportunity because for short trips, daily, wow, you can't beat it. It's cheap, it's efficient, and you have to worry about speeding tickets because they go like the blazes. But that's a, that's a vehicle you might use. And then if you're going on vacation, you know, down in New York City and taking the family, you might take a vehicle that you didn't use every day because you would you have a pickup truck. You don't want to plow on it. You use it when it snows. You use it when you can't get to town for other things. But 16 miles a gallon, you don't drive it. That's where it starts. And the more of those vehicles that are, that are we have on the road, the more charging stations you get. And the more people, the neighbors go, hey, so the fact he drives a little fast, you know, it's a, it's a pretty handy vehicle. And it costs a lot less to operate. Don't you um, think in Vermont they all, there also have to be more... Um, Electric vehicles that can really work in the back, muddy, Mud, muddy road. Mud you have to have brown wheels. You have to have oh, all wheel drive. drive. There aren't too many. Yeah. Tesla all wheel drive. Um, plus, if you can hit a button and they go up high to get over the mud season, they go down. But most oh. people can't. Most people can't afford those. Yeah. That's how it's going to expand. Once they begin to, once the charging stations come up and people feel more comfortable, they'll buy more. In the meantime. 92% of the folks are stuck with no way to reduce their carbon use in poor country parts. At the used car markets where, you know, four, was it four out of every five or three out of every four cars are sold in Vermont, at those used car markets, poor people don't have a choice. They get the hand-me-downs. And if you don't change the new car purchasing, those people, it's worse than having a carbon tax. You know, everybody else doesn't have it, just you have it. You've got to pay more for your gas guzzler because that's what's on the lot. So two have to work, pass on to EVs while you're getting off uh, reducing your gas guzzlers. I'm curious, um, with regards to climate change, is there any discussion in the legislature about what the impacts of climate change will be like for small businesses throughout the state and throughout the country? Because there's, there's I, that's rarely ever discussed. And the reality is, even if we're not suffering here, um, capital's going to dry up if, it, if, if the rest of the United States is suffering from climate change like Florida. Okay capital, the availability of credit is going to dry up, which is going to impact small businesses across the country. Insurance rates are going to skyrocket and may be unavailable to, to businesses. Sure. Um, I don't see those kind of things discussed. The, you know, right. climate, climate change isn't just um, floods and, right. and migration. It's, ma it's a Main Street issue right. because uh, without credit, small businesses disappear. Without insurance, people lose their businesses. Mm. And all of that's going to happen. So is that discussed at all in the legislature? Is there any view of what the impacts are going to be of, on, on the business world, which is you know, we're all dependent upon that? Yeah. Well, that's the proverbial elephant in the room. Uh, the conversation is not being had. You're right. The, the impact of climate change, you know, disaster relief, emergency resource management, these conversations are not taking place. They are between the seven progressives in the Ethan Allen room once or twice a week, but you know it doesn't. It's not. It's not a conversation that we're engaging in as a group, as a whole. Um, if you think taxes are high now, right? Ten, ten, ten years from now, I imagine what taxes are going to be like when, when we have to address. You know, the when we when we struggle to keep the grid online. Right. Yeah, right. Um, Speaking of the grid, that I mean, people may not realize the impact we, we've already had here in the Randolph area. November of last year and November of the year before, large parts of East Randolph lost power for uh, two days and five days. Uh, there's been flooding on Route 14 with a lot of erosion the last couple of years. Right. It's real now, and 
Yeah. I'm, I'm not sure people understand the impacts that are taking place already here. And that was relatively minor compared to the major weather events of 2011. Right. And we had... I've lived there for 30 years. It's always been that way. Oh, really? Right. East Randolph, South Randolph Valley. Oh, yeah. It's always funny. Well, <laughs> so... It, Thank you. Oh. <laughs> Just like water is 30 plus years. Yeah. 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 Route 14 is always flooded. Many loggers are. You're, you're correct. Yeah. But many loggers are not in the woods this winter because the, the ground hasn't frozen and, and they're right. afraid of tearing stuff up. So in answer to your question, if it's been estimated that if all the world cooperated on dealing with climate, was able to do something, it would be 4.5% of every country's uh, gross domestic product. Four and a half percent, that's what it would cost. Um, and so we looked up what the United States did during World War II. They spent not four and a half percent, but 40 percent of the gross domestic product to tackle the war. And they did it in four years. Forty percent. So, yeah, taxes are high and this, that, and the next thing. Um, if there's something that needs to be done, um, people do it. But many people haven't felt a sense of urgency in the way that the younger folks have. And old geezers like myself would like to see it started before I'm dead. The rest, everyone else seems to have all the time in the world. We solved all your issues. <laughs> I would like to hear some more about health care. I, I could tell you a little bit about health care for a while. Yeah, I was just going to ask if you could talk a little bit um, about that. So the, the health care committee is, uh, has been pretty busy. We haven't, we haven't tackled too many bills yet, but we've been looking at a lot of issues and taking a lot of testimony. The one that I've been most interested in has been uh, last, last year, actually Ben Jickling was one of the prime movers on this, was getting a, a rural health care task force put together to take a six, nine month look at the issues <laughs> facing rural health care, which is, you know, affects us here at Gifford and, and all around. Uh, and we just received some of that feedback uh, in the last couple weeks. And there's a couple of major issues. One of them is a, a big push towards uh, using technology, telehealth, to connect medical professionals that may not be right next door to you. Um, and to, to kind of broaden the scope of what a small hospital might be able to do to reach specialists without making people travel 50 miles to go down to Dartmouth or go up to UVM. Um, so we, we've got a little more testimony on that tomorrow, actually, and it's, it's been a very interesting topic. Um, but the other bigger problem for, for rural health care has been the, the workforce problem. We're, we're short uh, at least 70 or 80 primary care physicians in the state already. And as we see here in town, <laughs> the, the, you know, the old time physicians are all retiring and they're, they're being forced to kind of hang on a couple more years just to, to get us through. And uh, I was talking to one of my colleagues on the healthcare committee whose father was a small town doctor up in Waterville and he retired a couple of years ago and they're never gonna have a doctor in that town again. Um, so we're looking at ways of trying to, to bring more, more primary care physicians into the state or keep the ones that we have, offer some incentives at UVM Medical School. They, they graduate 100 doctors a year. Five of them go into primary care and most of them don't stay in the state because it's, then you have the, you know, what are you gonna pay? Um, we heard an interesting stat the other day about the, the split of, of primary care versus specialists in our country, it's about 25% primary care and 75% specialists. And in most other countries in the world, it's exactly the other way around. And so one, one idea is to basically offer, I mean, there's, there's debt reimbursement kind of schemes and that sort of thing, but one of the ideas we're keeping around is just a straight up full scholarship to anybody that wants to come to UVM Medical School, be, commit to being a primary care physician in the state for some period of time, maybe five years after graduation. And hopefully that will, one, supply us a little bit of, uh, of new resource. And also hopefully those people might stick around. But the, the economics around being a, a primary care physician are, are pretty dire when you look at being able to make 
five or 10 times as much money if it's just money, but when you have a $400,000 student debt bill to, to deal with, you're, you're looking for a way to pay that. So, and it's not just the primary care physicians, it goes down to the physician assistants, the nurses, the, the, whole, the whole array. I mean, you see it in the paper every, every week, there's five ads for various healthcare uh, organizations looking to pay bonuses and things like that. So it's, uh, it's a challenge and I, I don't think we have any exact answers. We've, we've actually had a couple of people from Gifford come and testify for us, so it's been, been interesting to see the, the hometown doctors come. Um, but that's, uh, that's one of the big things that, that we'll be working on, and I think we're trying to get a, a bill through that will start to address some of that. Yeah? Isn't it also an issue, uh, a federal issue, of what Medicare will pay and the rates that they pay for primary care, and they really need to raise them, and they haven't, you know? Well, that, that's, yeah, that's a, an issue for sure, and, and I think that affects, might affect the hospitals more than it affects the, the actual doctors, but uh, Medicare actually the pays more than... paying the yeah. doctors. Right. Get more the, the problem is probably a little more with Medicaid than Medicare because the rates there are much lower. And if you look at many of our rural areas, there's a big population of people that are that are on Medicaid, you know, all ages. Um, so it would be nice. That's again a little bit of a national thing. I think Vermont has actually done a pretty good job with the with the structure we have under One Care and having an accountable care organization of actually getting a little bit of more payment out of those services, but it's it's still a, a small step forward. Um, the the other thing we're looking at is is prescription price, uh, prescription drugs, and how how that market works, and trying to find a way to, if anything, at least slow the growth of of prescription drug drug prices. It's it's just shocking. We were looking at some statistics today. The one, the one that, this was the most painful statistic I've seen in the month I've been there, but uh, we were looking at the cost of your regular prescription drugs that you might take for a statin or something like that, that are, are have been pretty flat over the last several years. The growth is in very specialized medicines. Uh, one of them that we talked about was Humero, which you see advertised a lot, and it's, it's used for inflammatory diseases. And it's, it, I mean, it's a great medication. But the company that makes that drug spent $500 million last year on television advertising for that drug. And it's just, it's outrageous. And I mean, you see the ads, so you can't, can't avoid them. It used uh, to be that they were not allowed to. Right. Yeah. So once, it's sort of like, uh, you know, allowing people to donate to, to uh, political campaigns. Once you open the door, it's just, it, it goes crazy. So. Uh, I mean, we're talking about you know, are there ways we can import drugs from Canada and maybe take advantage of some of the lower prices there, but, but I'm not sure they have the resources in Canada to supply the drugs we need. Uh, so there's, there's a few initiatives there, but that, that is really a battle of just maintaining where we are. You know, major reductions are going to be a, a serious challenge, and I look at the, the number of lobbyists we have floating around our committee room, and I see why they're there. <laughs> They've got a job to do, and it's to protect their their customers. Yeah. I'm a nurse practitioner. I've been one since 1974. Glad you're still here. <laughs> and, and I and I just have seen a patient now. I've kind of I'm saying I'm retired with a question marks like this. And for me to continue to work, <coughs> and I, I made decisions to stop working last summer. Okay? That there are people like me around who can do stuff, but we have costs related to that. So right now I'm good till 21 in my certifications, in my licensing. Yes. My DEA uh, License cost eight hundred dollars. So I'm trying to, you know, I've been tr you know, for me to. Con I'm not going to renew it next time around. And so, and one thing that I hope you you you'll learn, you'll be learning that Gifford right now runs with the nurse practitioners. There are no. There's one full time physician in primary mm -hmm. care. Wow. I don't think I've ever seen a physician there. 
<laughs> full so there's one full time <laughs> Ken Mori, yeah. and uh, the other ones are once a week, two times a week, something like that. So think about other providers. You know, you got to remember that, mm -hmm. and don't create obstacles for them in their caring. So I've seen the whole gamut since '74 with a class of five. So I've seen things change over the years. No, the, the mid-level providers are the poor course of the, the healthcare system. And we sometimes don't like to be called mid-level. Right. Well. Because we have another kind of service that we do, but we tend to, you know, do primary care for sure. So I see the future in that direction. And so, uh, but I, the, you should be able to do something with semi-retired people or even retired people in terms of helping them help you. That's a good point. Thank you. Because I'm here, but I'm, I'm not ready to, I don't want to go working full time. But we should be using your talents. But you can certainly use, you know, I can, I can guide you or I can tell you my feelings about stuff I can for you specifically. Mm -hmm. well, I, and the other related problem is that it's very hard to find nurses and professionals that can get the teaching level where they can teach other nurses. And, <laughs> and I've done that plenty, but, you know, I've precepted medical students, you know, and, and nurse practitioners, and I've taught in diploma schools of nursing. So, you know, I've done that all. Well, and we've heard from some nurse educators, why should I go through two more years of training to become a nurse educator to then take a 50% cut in pay? Yeah, that's so. true. It's, it's a tough one. So there are people around. You just, the, somehow, they haven't been uh, helped mm -hmm. to, to kind of stay in there longer or um, make use of their talents. Are, are we sort of pushing young people away by not making them Vermont more affordable? For people who want to live here, who want to start businesses? I mean, if we're talking about taxing more for payroll, for paid family labor, I mean, aren't we pushing people away? People who invest in our local economies? <coughs> Well, I think on the paid family leave, you could see both sides. One is yeah, it's an additional payroll tax, mm -hmm. relatively small, but that's still it, something right. we're all struggling. Right, and and the argument that I've heard from several people is, well, it's just the wedge in the door, and then next year when you figure out we can't afford it, we're just going to make it, you know, a little bit bigger and a little bit bigger, and then you're you're going down that road. But mm -hmm. uh, I look at it from the other perspective of if if you're looking to come here and you're you're a younger person, you're thinking about a family, you're, both people are working, it's like, is there an opportunity to take advantage of a paid family leave if we do have kids or if our parents need help? Uh, I'd like to see that that would be a, an inducement rather than a, a negative. Well, uh, why make it mandatory? Make it optional? I think if it was an optional, it would never work. I don't think you'd ever get it's the critical mass. For some employers, if they have a means of doing it, don't they? Well, for I somebody mean, like Bob's M&M, he has bottle parts, he has gas folks. How's he going to be able to afford that? And then he's got to hire somebody else to take the place. No, I mean, these are on, people are on paid family leave. How's he going to survive? That's a real small business in Randolph. Well, I think, aren't the small businesses exempt like that? I, I no. don't know enough. I don't, no, I don't I think anybody's support. No, but nobody is exempt necessarily. Yeah. So, so what, what Paul, um, what Bob has the luxury of choosing is whether or not he pays the bill. Um, or if he puts it on his employees. So for somebody who makes $50,000 a year, at the end of the year, the cost to them will be something around $100. So it's pretty small. And they're afforded the benefit of taking 12 weeks of leave. Um, but then Bob has to hire somebody to take that place. What, what does he do now when he lets someone take a family leave? Does he have to hire somebody? I would assume so. He's still got to yeah. run the business. Still got to count bottles. You still got to right, right, right. You have to go find someone. You have to shut down because you got to hire somebody to take that place. The, the service has to be done. But he's not. He's not paying um, for the the leave part. The state is paying for that. So the person on leave is getting covered. But he, he, he has can, to hire somebody. Yeah, he has to hire somebody else. But that's a problem no matter what. Uh, hopefully that person will come back eventually and not just disappear. Does the pay, uh, does I mean, the pay family leave bill? 
I don't believe it does, no. <laughs> but I'll check into that. On the, uh, for I, 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 just, I don't know enough about it. Mm -hmm. That's a good question. Um, it's a great question. It's just, no. Being a business person, you still got to provide the service. You still right. got to have. No, I mean, and you'd like to think that, I mean, a lot of businesses, as they get a little bigger, provide some of those benefits as part of the, so. you know, the package to attract people. Right. So it, it's, you're getting down to the smaller business, might be three or four people. I mean, one of my colleagues on the uh, healthcare committee, she, with her husband, runs a, a flower shop in Essex, mm -hmm. and they have people that go out, they, they try to keep paying them, even though they're, they're out sick or they're out, I mean, it's just sort of because they're a family. Mm -hmm. uh, and that gets kind of tough as well. It's like we can do this for a week or two weeks, but we, we can't do this forever. So it's they, a lot of those those businesses have favored the, the ability to have someone be able to go out and, and know that they're covered. I, I think that the job is secure. I mean, that's kind of the idea, right? That you get to leave and come back. But I'm not sure. I'm not sure. Yeah. I, think that's I think that's the, yeah. It's a, I don't think it's true. It's a statement. That, that's, I think that's what the person that you just hired. I then. think that's yeah. what we're trying to change here. But um, but I'll, I'll I'll follow up with you on that one. Um, and like, you just got to think about how it impacts us people who are investing in small businesses. Mm -hmm. and stuff yeah, like and it's real money, and it even if someone's getting twelve dollars an hour, they're not making fifty thousand dollars at five right. seven hour. I'm pretty sure. No, right. <laughs> well, I mean, yeah, you're right. It, it's all I mean. real, real money. It's hard but, enough to make and to meet at fifty dollars, and if you're going to start taking more out. We just got to think of the implications of that to everybody. Well, so from from my perspective, with the paid leave bill, is it brings a level of um, uh, control and security to the workforce um, situation. So as a business <coughs> owner, Vermont is at full employment. Period. Can't. Yep. Period. We need to find ways, great point, Peter, to attract people to come to Vermont. And this is just one way to, A, attract people to come to Vermont, but also for me as a business owner who's, who may suffer, or a lot of other businesses in Vermont suffer from turnover in their workforce. <clears throat> and the statistics on women after they've had a child who do not return to their job is astronomical. And so that prevents me from being able to scale, borrow money, um, invest in other workers if I don't know that my team lead or my manager is going to be able to come back. It's um, the conversation around family leave needs to be seen as this is a great opportunity to create some security in our workforce development system here in Vermont. Mm -hmm. Well, and one of the points we can do that too. Yeah. I mean, if we want to retain quality people, we're going to offer them more pay. We're going to give them a better quality of lifestyle. We don't need the state telling us that we have to do it. They'd yeah, like to think the market would take care of these things. It doesn't, yeah. it doesn't yeah. always it doesn't always get there. That's, <laughs> the That's why we're having the conversation yeah. because they haven't done it. But I think one of the points that really convinced me on this paid family leave was uh, one of my other colleagues uh, pointed out: this is this is an issue that disproportionately affects women. Women are the ones that take care of the kids. Generally, they're the ones that take care of the, the aging parent, the relative. Um, and I guess it's a small step forward to maybe level the playing field a little bit. I think when a lot of people think about where they want to move and settle, you know, young people, they think about how good is the school system and can I have a family and comfortably and, and raise a family? And I think the hope is that this will improve our demographics issue uh, as well. My question is about you know the the largest um, government workers, state teachers, municipal. That's the largest single employer in the entire state. Mm -hmm. They're already covered under this. Mm -hmm. You have a pool with guaranteed pay. Why not build upon that as a volunteer and let you can sign up for that program. You know, anyone can sign up for that program as the governor has proposed, mm -hmm. as opposed to forcing it on Bob. Mm -hmm. Bob can sign up for the program that the majority of workers in this state, the largest employers, already participate in. Build on that, it's more secure. It has the benefits of a, a pool of, of workers that can, you know, um, garner better deals. That, that's mm -hmm. all. I mean, I agree, it should be something that's offered. 
I benefit from it, my wife benefits from it, you should be able to sign up and benefit from it. And so let's do that as opposed to force Bob to join uh, uh, something that he doesn't know what it's going to be. We None of us know what it's going to be. There's a lot of uncertainty, I think, that, and we don't know, you know, so we're hearing this, that it's being handed down, it's coming, nobody knows. And mm -hmm. to us, it sounds like another tax, another regulation, <coughs> the state government. I mean, some of us are a little overwhelmed by it right now. When we're just trying to raise our families where we're from, you know, there's, there's a cost to it. Mm -hmm. It's real. I guess maybe I'll be sick tomorrow. Oh, no. <laughs> I notice we're not getting the broadband questions we used to get. Um, because now the EC fiber is, oh, yeah. is building out and people have a world-class broadband to take advantage of, um, the EC fiber territory is getting young people that don't won't, won't go to Corinth and won't go to uh, places that don't have broadband. Um, they're it, that was an investment that we, we made locally because we were fortunate enough to have no broadband to speak of, and we were able to develop, invest in you know, communities to get good take up. And, and today, this community isn't talking about how to, you know, the need for broadband to bring bring young people in. And from many places in the rest of the state, where broadband is an even totally tougher right. thing yeah. than um, than family leave. Um, you know, if I go to Vermont, in many places I can get broadband. Well, it was kind of ironic that it sounded like part of that Iowa caucus reporting thing was yeah. was due to the fact that they didn't have cell service in some of the places they were trying to report from. Mm -hmm. So, it happens everywhere. The, um, we have people that leave rural Vermont to go to Burlington. And we have people that leave the cities to come to rural Vermont where they have broadband. Um, the rural areas of the United States are losing young people at an, at an extraordinary rate, which is devastating rural communities throughout the United States. And Vermont, for all our troubles, we're holding our own. Um, you know, we're not getting the ones we need, but they, we're not losing a lot more than we're, we're getting. And uh, I think everything we do to get young people to feel our schools are good, we can do business on broadband. Um, you can take family leave. Um, teach, you know, teachers and professors and people who get sixty, seventy thousand dollars a year. Their employers find a way to get them through the family leave issues. They get flex time. And they're valuable employees, but the average person who's you know, working an unskilled job is is just treated differently when it comes to family raising. It's, so it's, it's a tough call. It's a tough call. And that most of them were, oh, and was growing in retirement age and not in young mm -hmm. age. It's definitely growing in older yeah. sites. So I, I don't, I haven't heard that we are getting young people, or even that I think we're losing young people. It, it, it's, it's marginal. It's, it's, it isn't a mass exodus. It, Slow so trickle. Close, one, close, one of the yeah, dilemmas yeah, when we're close. when we're thinking about this <laughs> as individuals is we all know. The people that are leaving, you know, they're our neighbors' kids. They're they're the people, you know, Johnny and and the, and the kid who used to deliver the newspapers. When they leave, we know them, and you know, our heart's empty. When someone else comes in and you don't know them, um, your heart's still empty for the ones that left. But statistically, we're not doing bad with young people coming in. And compared to the rest of rural America, um, we're we're doing very, very well. We're the most rural state in the union by the federal definition, which is the number of people that live in, in municipalities of less than so many people. We're the most rural state in the union. Chittenden County is the only place that isn't rural. And we're you know, holding our own, and I'm trying our best to get young people to come. Mostly they're college kids that stay, they're summer people that stay, they're people that drift through and stay, they're, they come to visit their friends and they stay. <laughs> And we lose others that you know, go out to find out what the rest of the world is like. But I'd much rather be us than you know, Iowa, and Kentucky, and Tennessee, and Kansas, and Missouri, and all those states that are you know, losing people and boarding up their, you know, boarding up their buildings. And, oh. 
and I think it is very helpful with the broadband. That's yeah. an issue that yeah. Yeah. And there are parts of the state that don't have it yet. That's right. And it's they're, they're, still they're in their struggle. Mm -hmm. yeah. We're lucky. We were, didn't have any, which made it easier for us to get it. <laughs> One of those rare circumstances. Any more questions? No, well, thank you all for Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.